The Importance of Correct Behavior November 7th, 1979 Some practitioners are confused and lost because they don't faithfully follow the Tamma teaching. If they did, how could Buddhism ever decline? The problem is with the Buddhist followers who don't strictly follow the Tamma teaching, but not with the teaching because the teaching is always complete and perfect. It is therefore imperative for monks living in a monastery to be always mindful of their actions. They must not allow the Gilesas to direct their conduct so as to create friction amongst themselves that will at least cause resentment and at worst division or a schism. When you have resentment, it'll be difficult for you to meditate. This is crucial. It'll be good for you if you strictly adhere to the Thamma teaching that will prevent the Gilesas from directing your selfish behavior. Why can't you do it when it's so simple? You and the other monks are grown-ups and are good friends. You should be able to settle your differences amicably. When a monk talks or acts improperly, he should be grateful when the other monks admonish him. This is Bavarna, to gratefully accept criticism. The monks will do this Bavarna every year on the last day of Vassa, the rains retreat. Each monk will say to the assembly of monks, Sankang Pante Bavaremi, I gratefully submit myself to your criticism. Monks should therefore admonish other monks when they misbehave. But if monks aren't sincere about letting other monks criticize them, it will be useless and pretentious. An insincere monk is not a real monk, whose only aim is enlightenment, who will not instigate any trouble. The world, however, is usually full of clashes. Clashes for happiness, money, and power. Occasionally these conflicts grow to catastrophic proportions. But monks are not affected by these clashes because they are constantly eliminating the cause of these clashes. When you have to eliminate the cause of your suffering is usually hard. The hardship that arises from restraining and removing the Gelesas is an unavoidable byproduct that you have to experience in your quest for freedom from suffering. But this hardship is not for promoting the Gelesas that create more suffering. It's for boosting the Tamma that generates more happiness. The Lord Buddha undoubtedly serves as an excellent example in this regard. Had he not faced up to the pain of the body and the mind, he wouldn't have become enlightened and a great spiritual mentor. It's the same with all the enlightened disciples who also had to confront hardship in their quest for enlightenment. They never relented or quit. They all had to experience hardship right from the beginning. There isn't much opposition in other tasks. But in the task of eliminating the Gilesas, there are lots of Gilesas opposing you, sometimes to the point where you can't put up with them and unknowingly fall for their tricks that will put you to sleep. This occurs in many practitioners. For this reason, you have to constantly be on your guard. Mindfulness or sati is indispensable, and when you're continually mindful, sati becomes sampajanya. It's hard when you have to force yourself to be mindful. But you have to constantly watch your mind and pull it inside. When you're not watching, your mind will go outside and will harm and burn you. The Gilesas are never relenting or lazy. It's normal for a practitioner to sometimes feel weak or strong, especially during the beginning stages. But the Gilesas are never weak, not until the time when your Sati, Banya, Sadha and Virya are fully developed. Then the Kilesa's opposition will diminish because they will become weakened by the power of Tamma that will attack and completely destroy them. Then there will be no Kilesa's left to turn the Jitta against the Tamma. I would really love to see you become enlightened after all the efforts I've put in teaching you. I have never kept any Tamma secrets from you, but have always been ready to explain any Tamma that will benefit you because I want you to become enlightened. But you have to be resolute, wise, tough, and strict with yourself. As soon as you have realized mental calm, you'll immediately see the value of your practice. The happiness from this mental calm is far superior to all other happiness. After you have realized mental calm, you'll discover your true worth and the harm of your restlessness. You'll be enthusiastic to practice harder. These were the results of my practice. There are two types of mental calm. 
The first type, which most practitioners experience, is mild and gradual. The second type, which few practitioners experience, is sudden and dramatic, like suddenly falling into a deep well or an abyss, and then starting to experience psychic events, such as heavens and hells. This second type needs the supervision of an experienced teacher, but the first type can be practiced safely without any supervision. When the jitta enters into calm, it should be left alone until it exits from calm before it will be ready for the work of investigation. The elimination of the gilesas must be done with banya, not samadhi. Samadhi only rounds up the gilesas inside and subdues them, but doesn't destroy them. When samadhi weakens, the gilesas will become active and aggressive again. Your emotions can also diminish your samadhi. When you investigate with banya, the gilesas will gradually decrease. This is the proper way of practice that will eliminate delays caused by your addiction to samadhi. In investigation with banya, you should use the methods that suit you, on any object and within the framework of the Four Noble Truths. After you've understood the nature of that object, you'll also understand the nature of other similar objects. You should also concentrate your investigation on the body, using it to lock up your jitta by making the skin like a prison wall. You should force your mind to take a tour of the body, such as the flesh, sinews, bones, liver, kidneys, intestines, stomach, newly eaten food, and digested food, going from top to bottom. If you investigate particula, filth, and asubha, loathsomeness, you'll see impurity and unattractiveness. If you investigate the four elements, you'll see that every body part is composed of the four elements. They are not I or mine. The body is not attractive as the Gilesas lead you to believe. The Gilesas are deceptive. Whatever they tell you is not true. Is there any part of your body that is really beautiful? There is none, but the Gilesas keep telling you that there is, which contradicts the Thamma teaching which is true. As a result, they make you suffer. You have to force the Jitta to investigate the various parts of the body because they are the truth in terms of a Subha, elements, or a Nitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. You can investigate whatever aspect you like. When you investigate a sopha, it'll lead you to the elements as well. You can also investigate any one of the Dilakkhana, be it the Nittang, the Kang, or Anatta, or you can investigate all three of them as they are all interrelated. This is investigation with Banya. You should also compare your own body parts with other people's body parts to see that they are all the same. How then can your jitta become deluded or obsessed? Your jitta will gradually become calmer. Your unfounded perception of beauty will gradually decrease. After repeated investigation with banya, you'll eventually gain insight, dispel your delusion, and sever your attachment to the body. After having investigated with banya for some time, your zitta can become tired, similar to performing a physical task. It's then time to take a rest in samadhi. You should solely focus your attention on your meditation object to draw the jitta into calm. After your jitta has rested and re-strengthened, it will exit from calm and resume investigating. When you investigate, you shouldn't speculate on the outcome, but let it happen naturally. You should devise your own investigating methods based on what you've heard from your teacher. This is the way of developing wisdom. The investigation with banya will only cease after all the kilesas are eliminated. When your sati and banya have reached the level of maha sati and maha banya, You'll no longer have to force Banya to investigate, but you'll have to restrain it from investigating when it goes overboard and becomes exhausted. The jitta can get tired like the body if it doesn't take a rest. But the jitta at this stage is happier investigating than taking a rest, so you have to force it to take a rest. The way to rest the jitta is to enter into samadhi or calm, which is the correct thing to do because it's relaxing and soothing. I'd really love to hear my students telling me about the results of their practice. Who will become enlightened? Who will do the investigation? Who will destroy the kilesas? Where are the kilesas? What are the methods used to eliminate the kilesas? These are the things that you have to see clearly from your practice, which is a lot better than hearing from your teacher. Don't pay any attention to the affairs of the world and samsara. They are the kilesas creations that have for a long time afflicted you with immeasurable pain and suffering. You shouldn't have any doubt about this by thinking that you'll be good, happy, and at ease by letting the Gilesas drag you around, or by believing the Gilesas. You should always look up to the Lord Buddha, who also used to be the Gilesas' storehouse like the rest of us. 
He had already experienced the suffering created by the Gelaises. If he could have been enlightened with the Gelaises, he wouldn't have had to practice mental development. He would have remained a prince. You should take the Lord Buddha as your role model. You shouldn't doubt the Gelaises' ability to hurt you, be it greed, hatred, delusion, or lust. They're hurting you all the time except when you fall asleep. When you wake up, the Gedeses also wake up and start to hurt you with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and thoughts. This happens to every unenlightened person without any exception. As long as the Jitta is not purified, you'll never be free from suffering. The Gedeses' activities occur at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and Jitta. So you have to make the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and Jitta activate the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. By practicing mental development, you're changing the creator from the Gelesas to the Tamma, investigating with Banya whatever you see or hear. The result from this investigation is happiness. The result from the Gelesas' action is suffering. The Gelesas pay no attention to time, race, class, or color of people. They will always crash and ruin them. You have to change this by replacing the Gelesas with the Tamma. When you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, let Satipanya supervise you. When you think, let Satipanya direct you to think rationally. If this is hard to do, so be it. Don't be deterred by hardship, because it will hinder your progress, weaken and discourage you, which is just the Kelesa's way of deceiving you. Tamma never makes you weak. If you follow the Tamma, you have to be rational. The Kelesa's are never rational because they despise logic. They love, desire, and craving, which are their heart and soul. So how can you be ignorant of human nature after you've understood the Gilesa's nature? The hearts of all people are similar. All human beings are created by the Gilesa's and their own good and bad gamma. Consequently, Dukkha is unavoidable. How can this human body avoid being the home of Dukkha? Your house is not the home of Dukkha, but your body is. It's an aggregate of Dukkha. Kanta means aggregate. Every kanta or aggregate is dukkha. Roba, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyana are all dukkhang, anittang, and anatta. So how can these five kantas not be aggregates of dukkha? The jitta is also the home of dukkha. If you don't apply satipanya to eliminate this gilesa induced dukkha, the jitta will always be the home of dukkha, will never be free from dukkha, and will never be purified. If this is the case, what are you waiting for? How can you remain weak, lazy, and inactive? You should fight the Gilesas to the last breath. You should die fighting. If you don't die fighting, you'll surely reach the shore of freedom, the shore of Nibbana, like a true follower of the Lord Buddha who is not obsessed with this world of cemeteries, births, and deaths. As long as you're under the shadow of birth, aging, sickness, and death, you'll never find contentment. Speculation and theory is not the truth, but realizing anittang, dukkang, and anatta is. When you've reached this level, your doubt in your practice will disappear and your diligence will increase. You'll enjoy practicing and fighting the gilesas for your freedom from dukkha without any concern for your well-being. When your jitta becomes strengthened by your investigation with banya, it will be very powerful. No power in this world can be greater than the jittas and banyas combined. You must therefore develop anya. Don't be weak or heedless and never neglect your practice. Be always mindful. Don't crave food, but eat with moderation, just enough to sustain your body and support your practice. You have to be thorough and meticulous with your investigation, leaving no stone unturned, because it's the only way to become enlightened. The development of banya requires careful contemplation, investigation, and analysis in order to beat the gilesas, which are extremely clever and versatile, and to experience the enlightened bliss that was discovered by the Lord Buddha, whose sole purpose was to share it with all living beings. As followers of the Lord Buddha, you have to keep practicing, having the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha as your guide, not the gilesas that are constantly hurting you. Don't be lazy. If you put in a lot of effort, you'll be skillful like a boxer who has to do a lot of training before going into the ring and becoming a champ. It is likewise with the jitta. When you practice a lot of samadhi, you'll be skillful with samadhi and become a samadhi expert. It's the same with banya. You'll practice relentlessly when you're completely certain of the magga, pala, and nibbana. The jitta's strength will become formidable 
and you'll practice very hard without having any mercy for yourself. During the time of my intense training, my body was very fit for this kind of exertion. It was also in its prime sexually, so I had to fast in order to curb it and to keep the practice going smoothly. When I fasted, my practice went on smoothly, efficiently, and easily. My jitta was totally committed to the practice and paid no attention to my body. It wasn't concerned how grueling the practice might be. All it wanted was to achieve results. My dogged determination generated an intense, diligent effort. My aspiration was the main driving force. The stronger my ambition, the stronger was my exertion. This will undoubtedly be obvious to every practitioner. I couldn't remain still because I was very eager and hopeful. I couldn't help but put in an all-out effort. Today I can't do that kind of exertion anymore. My body is a lot weaker now, and needs assistance to keep it from falling over, and my zitta no longer has that kind of determination. I no longer have any aspiration for the magga, pala, nibbana, and the desire to become an arhant anymore. They have all unquestionably disappeared. So what is there to aspire for? Why do I have to practice when there are no goals for me to aim for? If I had to do that kind of exertion today, I wouldn't be able to do it. I would die before I got started. After my jitta had reached the ultimate goal, it stopped exerting right away. My zatipanya, which had been working around the clock like a tamma wheel, stopped immediately, like shutting down a machine or a factory. I had finished my task and became an entirely different person. As soon as Mahasati and Mahabanya came to an abrupt halt, they disappeared because there was nothing for them to destroy. Thereafter, I still practiced meditation, casually, not seriously, when I felt like meditating for mental and physical relaxation. This was how I came to see the immeasurable benefits of the Tamma that had fully taken control of my ditta. At the same time, I also saw the harm done by the Gilesas that used to dominate my ditta tyrannizing and hurting it for countless aeons. What then is there to be doubtful about? All the visual objects, sounds, aromas, flavors, and tactile sensations have existed since time immemorial. It's you who imagine and fantasize about them. When you see or hear something, it's your jitta that imagines or forms opinions about them, fooling you by telling you that they're good or bad, pretty or ugly, when they themselves don't know it. Your jitta is deluded by believing the Gilesas. You don't know the danger posed by your imagination. Only Zatibanya knows this and is capable of beating the Gilesas. As soon as the Gilesas start to form opinions, Zatibanya will know it right away. So how can the Gilesas ever deceive you when you always know of their deceptions? For instance, when you think of a tiger, as soon as you think about it, it will disappear. You'll know right away that this tiger is the product of sankara or thought formation. Or when you think that a woman is pretty, you'll know immediately that it's you who thinks. The woman doesn't say anything about herself. She is just a visual object formed by the four elements of earth, water, wind, and fire. It's you who form the opinion that she is pretty. As soon as this opinion is formed, Zatibanya will know immediately and the opinion will disappear right away. This notion of beauty or ugliness is the product of sankara which deceives you. This is where you'll see the deception of the Gilesas. Not out there, but here inside your mind. This is the way of realizing insight by knowing that you are fooled by the Gilesas which use sankara to do it. You have to keep on investigating until you've destroyed all the Gilesas and experienced true peace and true happiness. Then the years, the months, the hours, the minutes, and all the conventional realities or samadhi will not affect you anymore because you have let go. Previously it was the Gilesas that dragged you to cling to them, but after all the Gilesas have been destroyed, the jitta becomes entirely tamma. The question as to where the tamma is will disappear. Where are you going to look for the Tamma when you have found and experienced the Tamma in yourself? What is the Tamma? You already know this. How can you ever be deluded again? After you've found the real thing, why would you follow its tracks? The tracks will lead you to the real thing you're looking for, like following the foot tracks of an ox. 
After you've found the ox, you don't have to follow the tracks anymore. When you've acquired the genuine thamma, your endeavor comes to an end. After following the tracks of truth until reaching the real truth, the tracking is over. As a practitioner, you have to be resolute and earnest. When your train of thought becomes worldly and pierces your jitta like an arrow, you must immediately take out the arrow by stopping your worldly thoughts, no matter how intense your desire to think might be. You have to understand that this is your enemy mounting an offensive. You must suppress these thoughts. Don't cherish them. Then it will be possible for you to stop them. You have to subdue them with satibanya, which will not only curb them, but will also search for them, round them up, and destroy them. This is the way to take care of yourself and free yourself from harm and danger. You've already experienced lots of births and deaths, and should be completely chastised by them, and should have learned your lesson by now. When you are born, you'll also die. When you take up birth, you'll also take up Dukkha. The Lord Buddha said, Dukkha nati adhatasa. Dukkha doesn't befall one who doesn't take up birth. Sankara not only causes you to take up birth, but it also causes you to experience Dukkha by creating craving. For this reason, Dukkha nati adhatasa also means Dukkha doesn't befall one who doesn't crave. De sang ko. The extinction of Sankara created craving is supreme bliss. The Sankara created craving is now destroyed by the Thamma wheel, which is the middle way of practice, the Madhima Bhadibhada.